Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. This video is going to be all about Parkinson's disease. We're going to start off by talking about specifically how Parkinson's disease impacts the function of the basal nuclei, both with the indirect pathway and the direct pathway. But really to do that, we really should have an understanding of how the basal nuclei function normally. And to do that, we're going to do it piece by piece. We're going to first look at the direct pathway without dopamine and the substantia nigra shown. And then we'll add in dopamine and the substantia nigra. Then we'll do the same thing for the indirect pathway. Now a little bit about this picture first. Any box here that's gray, which really just includes this one and this one down here, these are going to be inhibitory neurons. They are going to function by releasing GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, and they are inhibitory. The white ones, by definition, are excitatory, and they're going to function by releasing glutamate or glutamic acid, as we might call it. So the thing about the basal nuclei is, if you want to get a movement, the thalamus has to be activated. And it's two specific nuclei in the thalamus, the ventroanterior or VA nucleus, and the ventrolateral VL nucleus. These two nuclei of the thalamus have to be activated. Okay? Now this cluster of cells right here is composed of the globus pallidus internus and a region of the substantia nigra called the substantia nigra pars reticulata or PR. I'll usually just talk about the globus pallidus internus, but they're both technically involved. Okay. And these are inhibitory. And if these cells or neurons were activated, they would inhibit the thalamus and inhibit movement. And so in the direct pathway, what happens is certain regions of the striatum, which is composed of the caudate nucleus and the putamen, are actually going to inhibit the globus pallidus internus. Okay. So if they inhibit the globus pallidus internus, then they are inhibiting the function of the globus pallidus internus, which is normally to inhibit the thalamus. And so by inhibiting the globus pallidus internus, they're preventing inhibition of the thalamus, and therefore the thalamus becomes active. And so what you'll find in the basal nuclei, and actually a lot of pathways in the brain, is that to promote activation, you actually need inhibition of inhibition. It's sort of like in math when you had two negatives and you multiplied them together, it became positive. So if you inhibit inhibition, you actually get net excitation or activation. And this process is called disinhibition because you're removing that inhibition. So when the cerebral cortex commands the striatum to activate, the striatum then releases that inhibition on the thalamus, and the thalamus can therefore uh, lead to muscle contraction. So you see here the thalamus actually relays information back to the motor cortex of the cerebral cortex, and then it goes down from the brainstem to the spinal cord to specific muscles. So the key is, if you want contraction, you have to activate the thalamus, and you have to inhibit the globus pallidus internus. Okay. So this is the direct pathway without dopamine or the substantia nigra shown. Let's add those in. So here's a specific region of the substantia nigra called the substantia nigra pars compacta or PC. This is actually the region of the substantia nigra that is impacted in Parkinson's disease. And you can see here that it has an impact on the direct pathway. So the substantia nigra here can actually modulate the direct and indirect pathways by releasing dopamine. So the regions of the striatum that are actually involved in the direct pathway have what are called D1 receptors. These are receptors for dopamine. So the substantia nigra is going to release dopamine and it's going to bind to these D1 receptors. And the key here is for the D1 receptors, the dopamine has an excitatory or activation effect. So how specifically is dopamine modulating the direct pathway? Well, let's compare it to without dopamine. So before we did have inhibition of the globus pallidus internus, but with dopamine, we now have more inhibition, so there's even less activity of the globus pallidus internus. One key here is when this is less active, there is more movement. And then before without the dopamine, uh, the thalamus was still activated, so the globus pallidus internus was mostly inactive, right? But when we add in that dopamine up here at the D1 receptor, notice 
there's now less inhibition on the thalamus. So the thalamus is even more active and we get more of that muscle contraction and more movement. So in other words, how is dopamine from the suspension nigra modulating the direct pathway? It's producing more of that movement, more of that movement. Dopamine is pro-movement, okay? Now let's look at the indirect pathway. So this again, dopamine and the substantia nigra are not shown. Let's understand this first. Now by itself, the indirect pathway is going to inhibit movement or it's gonna suppress unwanted movement. So you're sitting in your chair right now watching this video and your arms aren't flailing around, right? You're just sitting statically. So those movements like flailing your arms and legs and so forth, those are not happening because they're being suppressed. So the indirect pathway is always suppressing unwanted movement. The other thing the indirect pathway does is it inhibits certain muscles when you need other muscles to contract. So for example, if you're doing a bicep curl, we obviously talked about you need your elbow flexors to contract because that's how you do a bicep curl, right? Your biceps brachii, brachioradialis, brachialis, those are gonna be activated via the direct pathway. But that bicep curl isn't gonna to work too well if your triceps are also contracted at the same time. Um, that's gonna give you more of an isometric contraction and you're not gonna be able to move, right? So the triceps have to relax. And so in addition to suppressing unwanted movement, the indirect pathway also is going to inhibit the antagonist to a movement, allow it to relax so that way the movement is clean and efficient. Now the indirect pathway is indirect because as opposed to the direct pathway, which is in direct connection with the globus pallidus internus, in the indirect pathway, the striatum is not in direct connection with the globus pallidus internus. It goes through this roundabout mechanism to get there, and it has the opposite effect. So again, we have this motor program that's initiated by the cerebral cortex, and it's sent to the other portion of the striatum right here, which has connections to the globus pallidus externus. Okay? And then we have the subthalamic nucleus here, which notice is only a part of the indirect pathway. Now, if we want to suppress unwanted movement, we need to actually have the globus pallidus internus more active. Because remember, when it was less active, um, then the thalamus was more active and we get more contraction. So in order to suppress unwanted movement, we should have more activity of the globus pallidus internus. So more active equals less movement. And normally, the subthalamic nucleus right here is going to be responsible for uh, activating the globus pallidus internus, and that gives us less movement. Okay, and so again, with regards to the subthalamic nucleus, we're again going to have disinhibition. So normally the globus pallidus externus will be inhibiting the subthalamic nucleus, right? But the striatum in turn will inhibit the globus pallidus externus. So if we inhibit the globus pallidus externus, then this is no longer able to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. So we're removing the inhibition on the subthalamic nucleus. This is another case of disinhibition. Two negatives make a positive. The subthalamic nucleus becomes active and it can then activate or excite the globus pallidus internus. And when this becomes excited or activated, it's more active and it's able to now inhibit the thalamus. And so if the thalamus here is inhibited, then we have overall less muscle contraction in these pathways and we have less movement. And so overall, the indirect pathway is either going to inhibit the antagonist of a particular movement, so that movement is uh, efficient, or it's gonna suppress unwanted movement. And so you can imagine the indirect pathway is active all the time to suppress unwanted movements. Now let's throw in dopamine and the substantia nigra pars compacta. So regardless of which pathway we're looking at, we're gonna see dopamine as pro-movement, okay? It's gonna be able to modulate the amount of movement we get by slightly increasing it in both cases. Because if the indirect pathway normally suppresses unwanted movement, maybe in some cases we don't want it totally suppressed. We don't want it to be an all or none phenomenon, right? We wanna be able to modulate it. So maybe instead of totally eliminating a movement, we just maybe wanna slow it down, not totally get rid of it. And so dopamine's a way that we can avoid complete inhibition and get maybe just mostly inhibition, right? So remember with the direct pathway, dopamine here bound to D1 receptors and that had an excitatory effect on the direct pathway. Now for the indirect pathway, dopamine binds to a D2 receptor, and that actually has an inhibitory effect on the striatum, okay? So let's actually think about this. 
Remember that the striatum normally is going to inhibit the globus pallidus externus. But through the D2 receptor, if we are inhibiting the striatum, then the striatum is not going to be as effective at inhibiting the globus pallidus externus, and so the globus pallidus externus will have an increase in activity. Not a huge increase, but a little bit of an increase in a dose-dependent manner with the amount of dopamine. So this is a little bit more active. And remember the globus pallidus externus normally would inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. And so if the globus pallidus externus is a little bit more active, there's going to be, as you can tell, a little bit more inhibition here on the subthalamic nucleus, and the subthalamic nucleus therefore is going to be a little bit less active than it was before. Remember the subthalamic nucleus normally will activate the globus pallidus internus. And so as compared to without the dopamine, when we start adding in the dopamine, subthalamic nucleus is a little bit less active, and so there's a little bit less activation of the globus pallidus internus. And so with a little bit less activation of the globus pallidus internus, we have a little bit less inhibition on the thalamus, and so we're gonna get slightly more movement in the indirect pathway. So what you see here is that instead of totally suppressing a movement, we're going to mostly suppress it. So this is a way that dopamine can fine tune everything. And so what we see with the substantia nigra pars compacta and dopamine, got both pathways shown here, dopamine always is pro-movement. It's going to modulate the direct pathway to get a little bit more movement, and it's gonna modulate the indirect pathway to also get a little more movement. That is the normal physiology. You have to understand that before you look mechanistically at Parkinson's. But once you do understand it, it will explain why we see in Parkinson's patients they have issues initiating movement. Now before we go any further, I just want to mention one thing. These slides here where we talked about the direct and indirect pathways without dopamine or the substantia nigra shown, this is not actually how it works. I just showed these first so we could understand the more complicated reality where we have the direct pathway with the substantia nigra and the indirect pathway with the substantia nigra, okay? Now let's take a look at the case of Parkinson's disease. So what's the mechanism? It's progressive degeneration of the substantia nigra. So the more of these cells that you lose, the less dopamine you're gonna to have to modulate the direct and the indirect pathway. And we're gonna see that this substantia nigra is actually tremendously important. So let's see first how Parkinson's disease impacts the indirect pathway. Remember that normally the substantia nigra released this dopamine that produced inhibitory effects on the striatum via the D2 receptor. Now we don't have that dopamine. And so we're no longer binding to the D2 receptor and that striatum over here is gonna be way too active meaning it's gonna produce a ton of inhibition on the globus pallidus externus. So this is gonna be very, very inhibited. That means it's not gonna be able to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. And so the subthalamic nucleus is going to be very, very active, right? And if the subthalamic nucleus is very, very active, then that means that the globus pallidus internus is going to be very, very active. That globus pallidus internus' job is normally, when active, to inhibit the thalamus. But if this globus pallidus internus is too active, then we're going to have way too little activation of these nuclei in the thalamus and way too little muscle contraction and movement. Remember, with that globus pallidus internus, when it's more active, there is less movement. Okay? So literally, by eliminating the dopamine's inhibitory effects here on the striatum, via this D2 receptor, we get way too much activity of the subthalamic nucleus, way too much activity of the globus pallidus internus, and actually not enough activity of the thalamus, okay? So we get less movement here. And this actually explains why Parkinson's disease is a hypokinetic movement disorder, less movement. Now let's see how Parkinson's disease impacts the direct pathway. We have our direct pathway right here, and normally that substantia nigra released dopamine, which had an excitatory effect here on the striatum via that D1 receptor. And then the striatum would then inhibit the globus pallidus internus. Now, are we gonna get as much inhibition here on the globus pallidus internus if we eliminate this dopamine? Well, no, right? Because if we're not getting that excitation at the D1 receptor, there's a lot less inhibition by the striatum on the globus pallidus internus. And again, remember, if there's less inhibition on the globus pallidus internus, 
then we have more activity of the globus pallidus internus. And so really, the impact on the direct pathway is very similar to the impact on the indirect pathway. With the indirect pathway, it promoted too much activity of the globus pallidus internus. Through the direct pathway, it's not enough inhibition on the globus pallidus internus. And so this cluster of cells right here is just very, very, very active, too active, right? And so when it's too active, you get less movement. Why? Because when the globus pallidus internus is too active, it releases too much inhibition on the thalamus. So now the thalamus is very underactive, and now there's not enough muscle contraction or movement. Same thing with the direct pathway here. The fact that we have too much activity of the globus pallidus internus causing less movement explains why this is a hypokinetic movement disorder. So this less movement caused by impacts on both the direct and indirect pathways really explains some of those signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease that we talked about in the previous video. For example, this bradykinesia, which is that difficulty initiating movement due to impaired power generation in muscles, eventually it will progress to loss of power totally, which is akinesia, and it's the A of that trap. T-R-A-P, the cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease. We talked about that in the previous video, so if you want more detail on that, go back and watch that. It'll be just before this video in the playlist. But hopefully after this video, you have a better understanding of how Parkinson's disease impacts the basal nuclei and produces hypokinesis. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.